keep going with the uh, different talks for this afternoon. So let me introduce you to uh, Scott Brown from End Games, who's going to uh, explain how he's making money with uh, browser games and mobile games and share some numbers. Thank you, yep. Scott. Thanks. Sorry for the technical snafu. We now have a Mac presentation on the PC, so we'll see how it goes. So first, a little bit about myself. My name's Scott Brown. The company is End Games. Um, started in uh, January of 2011. Uh, there's 13 of us there now. Everyone's at least five years. Most of us are over 10 years experience. Um, before this, I ran a company called NetDevil for almost 15 years. We did MMO titles. So very different direction for us. Um, so far since starting, one of the best things is we've done 11 titles already, where at our old company it was usually four or five years per title, which is a nice change. Uh, and under production, we have about four other Projects. So the other thing that's fun is with a small group of people, we can change products all the time. Um, we've done stuff on Facebook, Congregate, uh, Chrome native client for the web, and we've done iOS, Android, Google Play, Amazon, and the uh, Boohoo Navi. We've got some apps on that now too. So a little bit about us. So quickly, I'll just kind of go through some of our different apps we've built so far and what we're doing, uh, how we're monetizing each of them. So this is a game called Bork uh, that's was on Facebook that we we're moving to congregate now. And this is a sort of MOBA or Dota style game, but it's all with spaceships. And so it monetizes through the purchase of ships. Uh, we sell skins. Uh, we sell what we call tech, which are small upgrades to your ship, and boosts, which are things like additional XP per match or additional credits per match. Um, and you can also buy currency. Um, this was our first mobile game we did. Um, Ryan's very proud of it. Um, so this is a game where you push a button and the number goes up. We just did uh, ads in this title. Uh, our next title we did was called Recycling Moo. This was like a puzzle brain teaser game that we tried the sort of free trial version and then you download additional content. Um, the free trial still downloads pretty well. The additional content, not so much. This was a title we partnered with Backflip on. Um, they did the distribution for us and we, we did the development. It's a physics puzzler type of a game. And um, with this one, we went free to play sort of at the very last second. Uh, we had intended to sell it and kind of at the last moment, you know, we, we and Backflip were sort of caught up with, no, everything's free now, we gotta go free. And so we sort of tied on at the end the purchase of currency. Uh, and we did a few different things. We sort of. So on the main menu, you could purchase things. Um, at the end of a, of a match, you could purchase off of the little chess box. And then during gameplay, if you had coins to spend that you hadn't spent for a while, we would highlight and flash a little chess box and say, hey, you should go spend some money. Um, tons of downloads, not a lot of monetization. Um, so this was the, our next title we did called Going Nuts. Uh, this was something where we were trying to get better about figuring out how to get you into the store and, and get you to purchase things. Um, fortunately, still really the shop only showed up kind of from the main menu or when you would complete a match. Uh, and in the shop, you can see we sold stuff like gear, which is power-ups, outfits, which is just changing your appearance. Um, sold both of those. And then during game, we had sort of like, you can see the helmet there. You could, you could use these consumables. So we were trying to do more consumable objects as well. Um, I'll get into some of the numbers on the monetization of this as we keep going. So this is the next one we did called Magic Coral. Um, it's really a, a reskin of Going Nuts where it's another endless runner but it's a fish game. Tried to do brighter colors. But what we did differently and has made a huge difference in terms of percentage of monetization was building into the game play loop going to the store. And the other thing is we don't call it a store. So here you can see the, all the fish are trapped in the little baggies and you've got to unlock the fish. And the other thing we do is we don't give you a fish to start, we give you currency to start, so you have to buy a fish. So we're trying to get you used to spending money, that that's what the gameplay loop is. You collect the coral, you come back to the sh shop, you unlock the fish and you get back into the game. Um, this is a work for hire project we did for somebody that had pretty interesting monetization. So 
these guys are selling probiotics and they wanted to show off what it does. And so we made these simulations of um, the, good, the good cells versus the bad cells. And you could, you could microtrans by buying their products, which would then add more good cells to the game. And you could kind of continue to play through. Um, I, think it, I think it turned out kind of cool. Um, and this is our next game that's coming soon. Um, similar idea where you're unlocking and purchasing dragons, and these dragons basically allow you to play in the game world. But what we did is, like what you can see where we're getting to is, we're making our, our store experience cooler and cooler. So instead of it just being a bland UI with a list of things to purchase, we're trying to make it more and more exciting. And so now you can see like the, the dragons, you, so I just did screenshots of a couple of them, are like full screen, in your face, animating, like we're trying to make it as awesome as possible so that you understand like, wow, I really want one of those things instead of just an option, uh, you know, a check mark on a list. And then in the upgrade store, same thing like the tail, the dragon tail animates, the wooden pieces are moving. We're trying to do everything we can to sort of make the store not feel like a store, but feel like a part of the game. And it's as fun to be in the store as it is to be in the game. So now we'll get into some statistics. Um, before I start, this is just we thought we'd share this kind of funny story. So this was a flurry report from Bounce the Bunny where we were looking at revenue and which packs we're selling. And we're watching this thing explode. And, we're, and it's at our top most expensive um, currency pack is selling through the roof compared to everything else. And we are so, so excited. I don't know if you guys know what this really is. We weren't actually selling anything. <laughs> um, all of those big packs that we thought we were selling were all hacked purchases all from China. And so it's just sort of a lesson of like, tools like Flurry are amazing and awesome for like watching your metrics, but they're not actual data all the time. And so we actually ended up making three times less than we thought that Flurry was telling us, all because it was hacked, hacked users in China basically taking the code away from us. So before we started getting to the stats, I thought it was sort of interesting to throw out that like it can be wrong. And as you see, like even now, Apple's fighting a current that Russian hack right now. And so it's going to happen. All right, so the first comparison is conversion of players who pay who pay something, basically. So in mobile, um, just to give a couple of examples from our titles, um, going going nuts, so basically, we average about every other play session, somebody buys something from the in-game currency store. And so we feel like that's a pretty good job of getting you to go to the store to purchase an item as part of your gameplay flow, but only 1% of the players actually purchase currency. Um, versus Magic Coral um, has a 10% of our users actually go and purchase something. Um, and the average pur purchase of currency from us is about six dollars. Um, now, in contrast, and by the way, almost all of my web data comes from Congregate, so I, thanks to them for allowing me to use this data. They have much better web data than we do on just our one title, and so I thought it would be a better comparison to them. So, in Congregate, most of their games only get about a 0.5 percent of the players actually purchase. But the range of the paying users is, is, even their low end is significantly higher than what we're seeing on mobile, right? So they're seeing 24 to $119 per, playing, per paying player. Yeah. What do you mean when you say it's part of the main game loop on Magic Coral? So what I mean is that you can't play the game without visiting the store, right? So after you play your round, you then go into the fish shop, basically, where there's show your fish are swimming around and the other ones are still locked away and you have to unlock them. So basically, we instead of making it a side menu that you might or might not visit the store, we make you go to the store as part of playing the game. It, it made a pretty significant difference. So I've really almost the same kind of a game. Um, so another thing is whales. Um, in mobile, like so for example, in Magic Coral, about 25% of our users bought the, buy the most expensive currency pack from us. Um, and that's 68% of our revenue is that large currency pack. Um, we're still not sure where that currency number ends. We put in a bigger one 
Imagine we put a hundred dollar lunch to see what would happen, but it's kind of interesting to see. We're still trying to find out like what's that right number. Uh, I see a lot of games selling currency at fifty dollars still too. So we're still trying to figure out what is the right top end number. Um, but congregate, you can see like um, looking at some of their across their games, it's typically two to five percent of their paying players are what they would consider their whale players, and they make up forty to fifty percent of the total revenue. Um, and they've have they have several games where people pay over a thousand dollars just to play the title, um, and so you want to make sure that your total amount of sellable objects or reusable objects you allow for that user to spend a thousand dollars in your title because if it's possible, some will do it, and that can make up a huge percentage of your revenue. Uh, next one is times played before paying. And so this is something we thought was a pretty interesting contrast between the two platforms. So for example, in Magic Coral, we see it takes about, we don't track quite exactly the same way Congregate does, but it's about four and a half games before someone pays, or about every four and a half games that someone actually makes and the paying players purchase something. Um, but on the web, it's a really different statistic. Um, when you're making a web title, it's you, you have to really be first driven on repeat players as your primary first initial goal uh, because for them, they're only seeing about 10% of their users pay after 50 plays, but by 800 plays, they're seeing 50% of their users pay. And so it's really about driving the user to keep playing more than it is driving the user to pay. Um, so pricing, this is kind of an, this is an interesting uh, differentiator as well, where in the mobile space, you don't have the hurdle of getting the user to enter their credit card or their payment information because they've already done it. They've probably already purchased an app or they've done something. And every game on the platform uses the same store. And so your, your number one goal in a mobile game, your pricing has to be value for the, the object, where in the web world, it's the whole trick is getting someone to give you their payment information. And so what, what we're finding in the web sales is that you can charge a higher price, like don't undercharge on, especially on your web in-app purchases, because the elasticity isn't there for, like going below $5 doesn't really gain you anything in sales, because it's all about getting them over the hurdle of putting in their credit card. And so on the web, you gotta be careful not to undercharge. Just, it's, we thought that was a pretty interesting difference between the two. Um, updates, obviously, and this is especially true you know, on the web where you need the more plays, but updates, more users, get better reviews, you can get additional revenue. Um, combination of metrics um, and forums and customer service or customer support. Again, you can't just use your metrics, but look at all of these things to decide where your updates need to be so you can focus that you're updating what people actually want. Uh, and then don't forget about sales. Like, uh, I mean, everyone's talked about sales and the power of sales, but you know, even Steam has all their great reports of just doing a sale for one day can drive sales even past the, past the sale date. It's very true on mobile and very true on web. So don't forget about sales as just a way to make your app relevant again. Hey, it's on sale today. You can drive a lot of, a lot of sales there. So some strategies, um, I, I talked about this, some of these before as we were going through the pictures, but building the store into the game loop is important. So you wanna really think about your design. You know, if it's an, an RTS, I always give it as, as an example for this, is a great example of doing this. In an RTS, you're always spending resources to do all your moves, to purchase your units, to then make the turn. And so spending in-game currency is part of the game. And I think the better you can do that into your game design, the better it's gonna monetize. Um, don't call it a store. You know, call it your upgrade zone or whatever store is an instant turn off we found for people. And so don't call it a store and make it as fun as you can. Make it, make it as gamey as the rest of your game. Um, <clears throat> vanity items are, are usually not the best seller in most titles. Um, but what we have found is that the more you can allow the player to show off the vanity items they've purchased, the better it'll monetize. So, so for instance, you know, if, you're, if you have a game 
it's a single player game and you can, you can upgrade your character, well then allow them to take the vanity items they've done. When you push to Facebook, for example, push the picture of the vanity item. Right? The more ways you can think to be creative about how to show off the vanity items they bought to other players, the more value they'll have in, in wanting to purchase those. Um, the next one is uh, popping up hints of things you can afford, reminding them, hey, did you know you could do this? If you do it all the time, they'll, they'll turn it off and they won't see the announcement anymore. But if you're smart about it, you can just every few plays or every time they reach a certain threshold, you can pop up notifications to say, hey, go back and check. Did you know you could afford this now? Um, Steve said almost the same exact thing here as, as we're talking about in the last presentation, which is your first order of business when they play the game is not to push them to in-app purchase. The first order of business is to get them to keep playing the game. And a lot of games make that mistake where right away they're like, look at all these things you can buy and buy this other thing. They haven't, they're not vested in your title when they first start playing it. They don't know if, if they want to keep playing it for longer. They're not going to purchase right away. And so pushing too much in their face early can actually be a uh, detriment to keeping players. Uh, and again, watch your metrics because the lesson you learned on one product may or may not apply to the next one. And so you really got to be careful about, hey, what's selling in this one or why may or may not be the same reason in each title. Um, some other thoughts related to monetization. Um, the first thing is uh, spamming the Facebook Graph API um, works amazingly well. Uh, we had one product we built for a customer that was an ad-based product, and when we added the pushing to the Facebook graph, uh, where you give it to Facebook and then it decides what it's going to do with that feed and where it's going to put it, it doubled their amount of users just by turning on that feature. Um, it's, it's amazing uh, how good that is. Um, and this was, this was a mobile app, not a, a web app. News system is something we stole from our MMO days, but like it's a great tool and not a lot of games use it, and I don't know why. But just having an ability to push news down to the user to either like tell them about parts of the game that maybe people are missing or tell them about other products you have is a really good tool. Uh, I really recommend building something like that. Um, keeping players playing in leaderboards is always good, but we found that doing a leaderboard that's friend centric is way more valuable than just a generic leaderboard because it's very difficult for someone to be the best in the world, but what you really care about is being better than your friends. And so Facebook, again, you, gives you a great way, or um, Game Center or whichever system you're using for your friends list, it's really good, a good way to have leaderboards but keep them friend-centric, we found is, is much better uh, retention tool. And then the last thing is a, a mission or a goal system goes a long way to getting play reuse out of the game, uh, and it also can get unexpected gameplay results. So if you tell someone, so like in Going Nuts, there's a mission to narrowly avoid 10 trees, makes you play in a way different than you, you would normally play, and it can add a lot of replay value to the title. That's it. Again, thanks to Congregate for letting me steal their <laughs> web numbers. So questions? So what we would do is um, we had two different systems. We have one that was like just a number. Like we said, most of the things in the shop cost, and I think in going in uh, balance, it was like 800 coins basically. And so we just had a threshold. Hey, if, if you've just broken 800, flash the thing on the screen while you're still playing, just to let them know like, hey, by the way, you can afford some stuff. Um, we didn't do anything. We haven't done something yet that's like you're almost there. Um, we did build a lot of systems like that in LEGO Universe that worked really well, that were sort of like the, hey, you just logged in, did you know you're almost done with this? Those kind of, that's really good, and that's something you could use a new system for really well.
it's it's better, right? And it's certainly like so. If you're Facebook or you're Congregate, you could hope that the user has at some point bought something somewhere else. But it's but the difference to me is that almost everyone I know on their Apple phone has already put in their payment information. Most people I know still have yet to put in a Facebook credit card. So like it's it's just you have a different problem when you're making. And so especially if you're just porting your game to both platforms, you might have to think differently about how you price on the phone versus the web. Just it's a, it's a different problem to think about.